Okay. Hi, guys. So we've got an interesting one today. We've got Nigel here, who's a geologist of 32 years, uh, extensive experience exploring all over the world. So thanks very much for joining us, Nigel. No, pleasure, mate. Nice to be on, Jordan. Let's yeah. get straight into the topic of this video, mate. Uh, and we're going to talk about drilling. So why, as geologists, do we choose to drill? Oh, mate, as geos, we have to drill. Um, we've got to prove ourselves um, worthy of our salary, and we can just, you know, we can think about geological models, mineralization, and it means nothing until you can actually prove it. And the way to prove you're right, or whether there's mineralization, or whether there's an ore body down there, you've got to drill it. There's no way around it. You can you can surface sample, you can trench, you can do geophysics for as long as you want, but until you drill it. It just absolutely means nothing. So drilling, it really is the the end game of years of exploration, and it proves whether there's something there or not, and that's it. So we've really got to... Uh, companies that don't drill have something to hide. <laughs> that's basically it, mate. You've got to drill. And, you know, when 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 you drill and there's nothing there, um, you've got to move on. You know, as geologists, we got all wrapped up in our own... Um, pet projects and we just really got to you know bite the bullet and say you know i've been working on this 10 years and uh, we drilled it nothing there time to drop it and move on if you don't drop and move on and you know go on to the new ground as an explorer you, you never get anywhere you know you're never going to discover anything and that's really the end game of uh, drilling is make a discovery make a mine yeah sounds um exactly right mate it's it's a shame when you you see companies just get really bogged down on the one project and instead of moving on and testing multiple targets, they'll just focus on, on one project and, and you, yeah, it can really, um, can really look bad and, and kill time. And yeah, if you're an investor and you, you also have a bit of a geology background, you can sort of identify this and, and then, yeah, maybe give that company a flick, but um, yeah, exactly right. You've got to test what, what you have and yeah, the, um, the way to do that is by drilling. So how as geologists do we come about picking drill targets? What other what are the um methods we use before we start drilling a target? Yeah, it's I mean what what was drilling is you know the is the end game. You you've got to you've got to do a lot of um, groundwork to justify drilling something. Um sometimes people, companies jump into drilling too early and they drill in the wrong place, and then you get a negative result and they you know they've been the project without actually doing enough groundwork so you've got to do your, your your mapping your sampling your geophysical surveys and it's a bit like um you know it's a bit like a jigsaw you need all those pieces together put them together analyze it create your targets justify your targets you know get uh, other geos in geophysicists or whatever other consultants and say you know this is our target does it stand up and when you're absolutely sure and you've got the money to do it you've got to go and drill it. So there's a lot of background in there, a lot of work to be done. And, you know, that's it. You, you drill it and you know you've got the, the the best target and you've drilled it and it's like, yeah, hit or miss, you know, stick or twist. Exactly right. You, you can't rush into it either. Like I've seen a lot of a lot of companies just burn money in the ground by, by rushing into um, drilling a target when, they probably should have done some more groundwork and just accumulated all that evidence before diving in. Um, yeah, so it's Absolutely. it's crucial to just yeah do that do that work first. Have a um, be able to explain the target that you're going to drill really clearly, um, and yeah, and then move into what method you think is effective to what drilling method you think is effective to test that target. So let's talk about some of them. Uh, what would you use yes. for first pass? drilling to test a target so basically the most cheapest method what would you um what would you go with obviously it depends on the ground but um uh, let's say you've got a you've got a target there you've identified from geophysics and all the evidence and geochemistry and trenching and all that what would you what would be the next step yeah you've got you that that's crucial it really is um you know if you're in in, in WA in Australia, you can get away with, you know, just rab drilling, just geochem drill, uh, RC drilling, dead easy. Uh, you've got the space, you've got the access, it's flat. 
And I, 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 I always like to go in uh, with like a, an, an RC or um, RAB or something like that first, because the way I see it, it's RC drilling is a bit like butchering. And then core drilling is more like a surgeon. So, you know, you, you want to prove that the, the, there is mineralization, there is a depth, you've got a chance of uh, discovery, creating that, an economic um, economic deposit there. Um, yeah, once it's you literally, prove that, yeah. It's yeah, literally so all it, about, sorry, mate, it's just, it's just all about just speed as well. That's what um, investors need to realize, that the different speeds involved with drilling holes from these different methods. So if we go through RAB or air core drilling, um, moving to RC to diamond drilling, that's basically a um, a time a timeline of uh, the speed of drilling. So the quickest way to get information, if the ground is suitable for the type of drilling, is to RAB or air core because um, basically you move into um, basically those types of drilling are only effective when you're drilling through clay or what we call regolith in the geology world. Um, you can't drill through hard rock with those types of methods. So they're basically just a, um, it's just a blade that spins through the earth and ch like churns through the clay and then yeah. um, sends sample through compressed air up to the, up to the surface. And it's the cheapest way to go about things. Have you done much air core or rub drilling in your time, Matt? Uh, I have done rab and air core, um, not a great deal. Um, I've done a lot of RC drilling, when, especially when I was in Oz or, or, or in Africa. Um, since I've been here in, in, in Latin America, South America, it's predominantly core drilling. And that's not because of, uh, you know, funds or availability. It's just that you're up in the Andes and you can dismantle a core rig and get it up there. Whereas you've got no chance of getting an RC rig up there. And when you're 5,000 meters, you, you know, you, you're really not getting the pressure. And if you get water, um, you know, it just causes problems. So, um, yeah, rab, rab drillings for young people. You know, if you're drilling 800 meters of uh, rab a, a day, you know, you've got your, you're running around after the rig and the rig's moving on to the next place, you know, 250, 300 50 meters a day in RC drilling is good. And then, you know, 30 meters of, uh, of say HQ core drilling a shift, you know, that's pretty good going. So like you say, it's the speed of things, you know, the fast, the cheap, the first pass drilling, RAB, air core, uh, then onto RC, which is more, more accurate, a bit slower. And then onto the most accurate, precise drilling, which is the most expensive, uh, which is core drilling. So it's a, it's a staged approach. Very um, interesting point about that I didn't actually realize uh, until you just said it. Using compressors up at altitude in the Andes, is it an issue? So using RC drilling to drill out some of these huge porphyries you see up in the Andes, do they they use that approach at all, uh, even like maybe for pre-collars or, or, any, or anything like that? Or is it just all predominantly diamond drilling? It's, it's predominantly diamond uh, core drilling, yeah. Um... The, the 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 downside of core drilling is you need you need water you need good prepared pads and when you're up at, at altitude and it's winter you know your water freezes so you've got to keep your water supply absolutely spot on your RC doesn't need so much water uh, if you're up at five thousand meters obviously the air you, you really need an auxiliary and booster do a pre collar down to one hundred and fifty meters case it off and then di uh, diamond tail it uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, you know, face sampling, RC bits, RC hammers, dual core, uh, dual tube, sorry. They're really, they're really accurate. You know, I'd, I'd put a lot of faith into it. Um, so, you know, those guys do the pre-collar and RC and then finish it off with diamond tail. And you've got to drill deep at porphyries. You've got to go a kilometer deep. Um, you know, it's still in mineralization. You see what's been happening out uh, in Argentina. You know, the oh, yeah. <laughs> a kilometer of, you know, a percent copper <laughs> it's, it's just go insane hey eh? it's like it's yeah. another world i haven't worked in that sort of field before i've just done all my exploration in western australia where you have sometimes up to like 150 meters of just clay and soft regolith before you hit any hard rock um yeah. but yeah this this story up in argentina i've been following NGX. they um 
they basically stepped out from Philo, Philo de Sol, the yeah. uh, discovery a couple of years ago um, of a huge, I think it's a high sulfidation um, epithermal to a, into a porphyry. And yeah. they basically stepped out, followed this structural target uh, off that deposit. And then with their second diamond hole, without doing any other exploration in that area, they nailed this incredible um, incredible result of, of basically hitting another porphyry, what, what looks to be another porphyry, uh, with the second hole they planned. So that's a, that's a success story from just using diamond drilling off the, off the go without any other um, cheaper method of exploration, which I thought was very interesting. But I suppose it's the only way to sort of discover these porphyries is just to sink these big, deep diamond holes down to a kilometre in the first phase of drilling. Yeah, yeah, you have to do it. And, you know, the, the good thing is that's what's going to move your share price is is is, is drilling. Um, it can crash your share price if the assets don't come back as well as you hoped. But, uh, and that's where people sort of start using equivalent rather than just, you know, reporting copper or gold or whatever. So is you, that so? You, do you want to talk about yeah. that a little bit, mate? So yeah, give we'll us, get, give get us a little rundown that. of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty ballsy moved, you know, to 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 hit off, um, you know, coring program from the get go. Um, I, I'm sure they've done they've done a lot of other work. There's, they've looked at geophysics and, and and the geochemistry. You've got to get through the lithocap, and you've got to get through to the good stuff underneath. And you know that takes money, it takes patience, it takes access. <laughs> What's the um, typical thickness of the the lithocap in the Andes drilling out those porphyries? Do you do you have a Ooh, number it, for us there? Yeah, you can. Oh, you can be up to a couple hundred meters of lithocap, if it, you know it's a true lithocap. If it's you know if it's all preserved there, you can have ten meters. You can have a hundred. You can have two hundred. You know, it just depends on uh, what what's what's left there, what's eroded. Um, yeah. So you know, get through that, and then yeah, call 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 down to a K. Yeah, um, incredible, incredible. I'm used to um like exploring in Western Australia where you've just got like I said hundreds of meters of um, clay and regolith um, and then it's it's super cheap just to go in with an air core rig and punch out uh, a, a hundred hole program just to first pass test an area and then um, yeah if you whatever hits you get through this intense drill program you just follow up with uh, deeper RC drilling and that's yeah. a classic that's a classic way of going about things in Western Australia and it, it kind of takes um, it kind of takes the pressure off a little bit because you can test so many targets. But compared to drilling these these porphyries, you see, you have to get that one target spot on because you're spending so much money diamond drilling. Uh, but yeah, back in back in Western Australia, with these different types of drilling, uh, let's take it back to drilling out resources. Which drilling method are you going to use to drill out a resource? Oof. Yeah, it depend, depends on, I guess, the deposit type. The setting, the geology, you know, you can it, 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 in 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 coal, you know, you can probably drill every two hundred meters just using RC. You know, it's going to extend out. You know, whether if you, you know, if you're going to drill out a deformed VMS, uh, you probably want uh, directional drilling. You want some uh, core in there, uh, but once you sort of get a hang of how the mineralization in the ore body sits, you know, you you, you can step back. And once you understand it, you can say, okay, we don't need to core drill every single hole. Um, we can infill it with RC between these two core holes, as long as it you know, stands up to the jork, um, uh, prescription of jork. Uh, as long as you can put a resource to it, it's 43, 101 compliant, jork compliant, that's fine. It's, it's what does for each individual deposit. Yeah, um, exactly. One uh, thing I want to highlight between these different drill methods we've got here. So let's go back over them. So we've got air core, which is your, your uh, first pass sort of approach. If you have soft regolith at the top of the, um, at the top of the, uh, in the clay zone. And then you've got RC drilling, which is a little bit more expensive again, but it still, it uses compressed hair, basically drives a big hammer into the ground. And then you move into the most expensive, which is diamond drilling. And that's just basically, um, it's just a coring, so it's a spinning hydraulics that um, is perfect for 
accuracy and getting the highest quality samples to add into a resource. But I just want to highlight that when I was working in West Australia, and I don't know if you've seen anything like this before, but I've actually seen a resource being an underground resource being drilled out with an RC rig before. So basically a whole heap of RC holes, which have gone into producing this resource, which is quite rare because usually if it's an underground resource, you need to, you need diamond drilling just for the depth and to get the accuracy because RC drilling accuracy, yeah. accuracy can go, can go anywhere. It's just a big hammer bashing into rock and it's not, not super, um, not super accurate. But if you have a good mm-hmm. driller and a good drilling company, it can be deadly accurate. But, but I actually saw that in Western Australia, which was a, a big thing at the time because it brought the cost mm. of the whole drilling down substantially. And they basically punched out this resource for, um, yeah, bugger all drilling costs. Yeah. No, it's awesome. I mean, like, like I say, once, once you're confident in what you're, you, what you're drilling, you're sort of just uh, rubber stamping it. Um, yeah, to, yeah. It's yeah, horses for courses, really. Then, there, mate. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, core, core drilling is 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 the ultimate. You know, you can get so much information from there. Um, you know, your downhole survey. You can run. Um, you, you you run your geophysics through the rods. You can with the RC as well. But you've got your geotechnical data. You've got you know you can cut it so you still remain half your core. You can put that in into the 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 core shed. And you can come back to it time and time again, where the RC, you know, you have your chips. Yep, they're good. But again, it's, you know, it, it, they come up to surface, not, they're not in situ where the core is. You know, it's from there, you can orientate it, you can see all your um, your fractures, your mineralization, and you just get so much information from uh, core drilling. But, you, you know, all in cost, $350, $400 a meter. You know, you're talking... You know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and obviously it's a lot slower. So, what's an average, um, what's an average day for drill, diamond drilling? What's a good sh- well, one shift? So, how much call would you get for a one shift of of diamond drilling? So, yeah, you know, I, I sort of work on about thirty, 30 meters a shift. A uh, shift being eight, say eight hours uh, to twelve hours, depending on the law, whatever. Uh, and that's HQ, uh, NQ, which is a smaller smaller uh diameter uh you could you know get up to 60 uh pq which is again bigger than the hq uh if you're getting anywhere sort of like 20 20 meters a shift you know you, you're pretty well going it's just as a rule of thumb depends on the ground you know if it's all broken you can get jammed you can get the water blocking off and you've got to pull and trip out and clean it up clean it up um but you know yeah you you, you can you can get good Good drillers and bad drillers so you can you know if you get a bad driller on a, uh, a diamond rig you know you can waste a lot of time and and money um i i i've worked with some exceptional rc drillers in in, in wa up in the in the pilbara and they could nearly sort of uh directional drill it you know just putting on the, the, the pressure on the bit speeding up the rotation they could you know they they could pull it back up they could drop it um so it just depends on the the training, the level of training of of, of the driller, which is, yeah, very variable. <laughs> it's so important to have a good driller on um on your program you're drilling as a geologist. It's 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 critical to getting um yeah basically getting results and moving through programs at speed and not getting bogged down. If you have a good driller, there's always a um I don't know I've worked with a lot of different drillers there's always a little bit of a clash between geologists and drillers you find because yeah, they always kind of push back on, on one another, but at the end of the day, the goal is still the same. It's let's drill as fast as we can. There's nothing worse than um, when you get a, a driller though, that comes in and just basically throws safety out of the door and then hammers uh, drilling as fast as he can, like really working his offsiders who are his helpers on the rig. They're called drillers offsiders. Uh, and just hammers them all day to exhaustion, and you're you're there as a geologist monitoring the rig, and you're seeing this happening. And it's your it's your job, especially if you're working for a big company, is to step in and and control the situation. And then then you can get, get some uh, confrontation going with the driller. But yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've had any experience with that, mate. But that's a that's a classic geologist uh, driller chronicles, I guess. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, 
I, as a junior geo especially i i love drilling i absolutely loved it and if you could get on well with your driller you got the best out of the driller they got the best out of you as well um you know a driller wants to drill you know 20 50 meter holes every day laughing and then you say no no we've got to go through this and yeah we've got to go through that and yeah it's going to be slow you're not going to maybe make your bonus today but you you might tomorrow it's 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 a two-way street um and I, I would encourage every geologist, young geo as well, is to learn about drilling. I I, I could strip down a hammer, SDS um, hammer up up in the Pilbara, and I watched the geos. I watched, uh, sorry, the drillers, the offsiders, how how they changed it. You could listen to the rig and understand what was happening with the the compressor, what's happening down hole. You knew where there was a problem as well as the 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 driller did. Um, and like you say, if you get a bad driller, um, for you as a geologist, um, it, 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 they can ruin your samples. You know, if, if they're just drilling down a, a rod and just opening the, uh, the splitter every, every meter is that if, if it's flying down and then they pull off the bottom after the rod and you see all your sample come up, you think, well, you know, the, the previous six samples have been absolute rubbish. It's all contaminated. You haven't, you're not really sampling, you know, at, at the, face of the bit it's all just getting clogged up on the outside of the drill tubes you you know it's it's awful so you really as a geo you have to understand the physics and and how machines work and if you get involved you actually turn out to like it I, i've i've drilled a couple of rods and uh, absolutely loved it i won't say who for <laughs> i didn't get if, if i ever yeah. mentioned that that one of the yeah. one of the companies i worked at the last one they would they'd straight away find me if you say you went in you <laughs> went anywhere near drilling a rod or something <laughs> health and safety <laughs> yeah but um you know dr drilling has got a lot safer now uh there's no running rods um you know there's, uh, there's there's cages that go around the, the rods when they're spinning and um you know blow off valves and it, it, it has uh it's a lot safer but again you know if you, if you get a driller who who encourages people to take risks you know you, you're drilling with rods that spin very very quickly you're drilling with compressed air that can expand and blow out your lungs you know if, if you're not careful so you do have to be on your on your game all the time, um, but as a geo, you, you force yourself to get on with the drillers because that act of drilling, your job could de depend on it. You know, if you if you hit a duster and, and there's nothing there, as an exploration geolo geologist, you're, you're the first guys out out the door. You know, when when the recession comes and the prices drop and or whatever, you know, say, so, well, that project's dead. You're out the door. So you've really got to uh, be, be on your game. The geos are working in, in the mines. You know, that they're, they're in the mine. They've got the resource. The company's making money. They're very unlikely to get, get the flick. Expiration is always the first to go in times when times get tough. So you've got to be on your game. Exactly right. It's... Um... Yeah. It's very important to to realize this when when you are working in an exploration team um, but like you said the, the relationship between geologists and drillers is so important and quite often i've noticed over my geology career is you get these guys coming straight out of university with these shiny honors degrees or phds um, and then they're put up with a driller to start off in the industry and they just don't get on together at all and i think it's like if you're looking you're doing research in a, in a company and you're seeing these geologists with these flash credentials phd honors first class all that um it doesn't necessarily mean it's a it's a good thing for that company to be honest uh it's it's right. there's a lot of stuff that happens outside of that like these relationships with your contractors which is so important to a company no, absolutely. I think um, I'd much rather have a non honours student as a geologist on a rig who's got good people skills. And of course, here we are in Latin America, language skills, which is so un un under, you know, no, no one pushes language in, in geology. And it's absolutely critical. You know, Ge Geo said to me, oh, Nigel, can you get me a job out in in, in in Peru. And I said, well, do you speak Spanish? No, 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 it's okay. No, I said, no, <laughs> you need to speak Spanish. You know, that's their second language. 
English might become third or fourth. And as, without speaking Spanish, you will never, ever get a real job as a field geologist in, in Latin America. You just, you just won't. How are you going to speak to somebody? You know, if you, if you, if you can't speak to your driller in English in, in Australian, in Australia, let's say, you know, how are you going to do it here? Uh, people skills, people management uh, is so, so important as a geologist. And, um, you know, your attitude as well, you know, just be, just be yourself, be, be humble. You know, there are a lot of people skills um, as for being a geologist. We were doing ESG before it was called ESG. We were doing that. <laughs> now that now they've created ESG, it's OK, you're an ESG people. Geos were doing it decades ago because um, they, they run projects, they run companies, they run regions. Uh, we were doing all that. And it is part of a geo's job. What do you think are the main uh, things to watch out for on releases from companies regarding drilling? What are some of the important things to to note? Yeah, pre press releases and, and and drilling information can can be very misleading unless you really sort of you know sit down and go through it. What you've got to look out for, especially, is you know when somebody says oh drill hole collar from to intersection assay you've got to know if that's a a true width um or an apparent width you have to look at uh the assays their collars whether these guys have actually produced a cross section that shows all their drill collars um you know the the uh, the, the collar amgs whether They've released the assays as a, a an equivalent, or they actually break it down into this is the percent or PPM copper, gold, zinc, because um, I'm not a great fan at all of equivalents. I I think people use equivalents just to make the number bigger, to make it look interesting. Um, I think there should be a, a disclaimer. Maybe there is that if somebody says, "Oh, we've got a 06 percent." Uh, copper equivalent in this intersection think okay what's in the equivalent is it two elements is it 10 uh you so you really as a you know a, a, a non-geo as a potential investor you've really got to drill down because they can be extremely misleading um yes you know buyer beware you know th th there's a lot of pumpers out there who just you know it will just spew out all these numbers and for the uninitiated or the, the people who don't look hard at the numbers will be misled uh, themselves. You know, so you, you, you do have to understand that. Look at the drilling method. Is it RC? Is it PXRF? You know, people are putting, you know, XRF numbers in there. You know, is, is, is that altered? Um, especially with, you know, things like lithium. It's, it's complicated. You know, metallurgy, you've got to look at the metallurgy. Um, so, yes, press releases, look at them very, very carefully and understand every single bit that they, they, they're, they're reporting on. Yeah, exactly. Um, with where you can find out what type of drilling is uh, has been used, it's a quick one. You can just check the whole ID, and usually at the end of the whole ID, they have the abbreviation. So it'll be for um, air core drilling, it'll be AC. RC drilling will be RC and diamond drilling will be DD or DDH. Uh, it's just a quick way to check on a geological cross section. All the, these geological cross, cross sections should always have the whole ID and then just see what method's been used and make sure that trace is realistic too. So the trace of the drill hole is exactly um, what it is. So with these different drilling methods, holes can substantially move as they're drilled. As I said before, when you've got a big hammer bashing into the ground, it's never dead straight. So diamond drilling is the most accurate and that's that's why it's the most expensive pretty much. And RC drilling, if you have a good driller, you can get really straight holes, which is of course always the aim. And um, what, what happens with these two methods of drilling, they send down a survey tool to take a survey every interval that the hole is drilled. So it would be like 30 meter intervals. I think that's what we used to do. Um, and then they record the direction of the hole 
as it's being drilled like that. And then that, that information comes to us, the geos, and we, we are basically tracking that as that hole is being drilled. So we know exactly where it is and if it's heading towards the target, which we want to uh, intercept. So that's a very important thing to consider when you're seeing a release is make sure that trace of the drill hole is representative. Um, I've seen RC holes that have just completely kicked right out of like the, the drill has just hammered it and it's just gone into oblivion yeah. upwards. Uh, and then you get the survey back and you're like, geez, let's, and you've basically got to cancel the hole. So um, that'll hardly ever happen with diamond drilling. Diamond drilling is basically dead straight. You can, you can almost guarantee that it's a, um, it's a slow method and, and it's super accurate. And if they're off course, you'll, the drillers will come to you and, and let you know and everything. But with RC drilling, they, they just want meters because that's how they get yeah. paid. So they, they will try and almost deceive you as a GA just to get those meters in the ground. So if you see these holes going off into oblivion, you've got to, you've got to make a call as a GA. You've got to say, that's not going to test our target. You've got to cancel the hole or you drill it and then, um, then just work the, work the trace in to get whatever geological information you want out of it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's one to look out for on the releases. Make sure that hole trace is representative of the hole drilled. Absolutely. It's um I, I I've I've seen press releases before. Um that they've got, you know, they've published these wonderful drill results. Then you look at it, and then you look at they've they've all started sort of a hundred meters away, but they're all they're all going to the same target. <laughs> Ridiculous. So it's it? oh that's wonderful, but they're basically essentially just re it just tests the same target, it's got the exact same assays, it's it's basically got um you haven't got any information there. You've just blown a whole heap of money. Uh, yeah. Bear in mind, geologists geologists do make mistakes with drilling as well. I've been um, guilty of this. I've got the uh, when you when you plan drill holes as a geologist, you set a dip, so the the um, the angle at which you want the hole drilled, and the azimuth, which is the reference um, azimuth, which is like the reference in a three sixty degree circle. So I've uh, printed out a drill program and I've I've mucked up the dip and the azimuth and of course I've drilled some holes that have literally crisscrossed each other. <laughs> <laughs> the aim is to obviously test your body in, you know, consistent lengths to get as much information as you can down dip of that um across your body. But I have actually I've actually crisscrossed some holes. So yeah. guilt, shame guilt on you. Mate. I've, I've never days, done mate. that. Oh Jesus, I should sure. <laughs> just exposed no. myself here. <laughs> I was, um, yeah, very sorry for that. I remember seeing it, my heart just sunk. I was just like, oh no, we're drilling in this tight corner of a pit, an operating pit, and we had a limited time to get in there. And I was just rushed in there with a drill rig and, and just belted out these two holes. <laughs> <laughs> Gone the wrong way. That's uh, a carton, so, mate. <laughs> oh, carton, I thought I was going to lose my job, but yeah, lucky it was, um, lucky it was a major company, not a junior. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. They can, they can absorb those. Yeah. They can absorb yeah. it. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, no, yeah. What else we talk about drilling wise, mate? It's it's yeah. one of those things well, where like it's 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 just such an interesting factor of being a geologist is is drilling because it's a huge part of your job is understanding what drilling is. Like when you first come in the industry as a geo, you have basically got to go and learn. But the trade, I think, you've just got to focus on how a drill rig works, and and yeah, um, it's it's very important to to prepare for if you want to go down the path of working as a geologist. Is you're going to be standing next to these drill rigs, which are as loud as a jet engine. Uh, they're dusty. You got to wear a mask all day. You're usually drilling in forty five degree weather if you're in Western Australia uh, in the outback of Western Australia or freezing cold conditions in the, on the top of the Andes. Um, yeah, what are some other things with drilling we can, we can help really investors understand? Yeah, I, I think, um, like, like you say, dr drilling is the epitome of, or the goal of every geologist. And every, a, a geologist who doesn't like drilling or take an interest in drilling is, is an academic. It's not, you know, that, that's it. it it's, it's drilling is, the proof of the pudding of everything that you've um, worked for in, in, in that project. And, you know, you just hope fingers crossed that everything works out and you make a discovery. And I, I think that's the, what, what, one of the main things I, I would take away from this, uh, this interview is you will never ever make a discovery without drilling. That's it. So 
you, you, you have to drill. And if you drill and it's not there, move on. Um, and, and, and with drilling, because it's so expensive, you know, if, if juniors don't have the money, they can't afford to drill. Uh, that's, that's tough. That's, you know, it's a tough break, but when you do have, the money you must drill and you must assay properly you must choose the right assay spectrum you know for acid digest blah 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 and we'll get on to the next thing now which is so important is is the the amount of data that drilling generates is, is enormous it's huge and it's so valuable now so many juniors you know sort of like oh, oh, oh yeah we didn't hit it you, you you've got to store that data on a database have a proper database management system. It's it's all there. You, you you probably spent millions on drilling, and you know that's your the, the value of a junior. Let's say is in its intangible drilling database. You've got millions of dollars tied up there, and you can make a deal on it. You know BHP might come in and say, well, you know what, you've you've drilled this area. We'll pay you three million bucks for um, your drill database. Let's share that. So it's never wasted, even if you might have drilled duds, you know, as they always say in drilling, you know, if you drilled here and there's nothing there, well, the deposit isn't there. It's, you know, where it isn't, you know, it's another place. So your, your drilling data, the GCM database is so valuable and you should always look after your data, make sure it's clean. Somebody might just come in out of the blue and say, well, let's have a look at your database. And if it's all over the place and it's in PDFs, it's not stored correctly you know you might miss that especially when people are looking at lithium now no one really sort of looked at lithium or rare earths for ages but all those geochemical analysis were always there and so if you can access it and you know hand it over to someone you're, you're at the head of the queue you you'll get that deal and you'll survive and you'll live to fight another day so looking after your drill data your geochem and your geophysics databases is is so so important i, I can't stress it enough yeah, it makes makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. You've um, yeah, obviously these things can be worth millions with the amount yeah. of money. And like, if you if you haven't tested um that drill target, if you if you've got some geological information from geophysics or geochemistry, um, yeah. So if you've got holes that can explain what that anomaly is from that other exploration information, then that's value in itself, even if it. Uh, doesn't re doesn't return anything significant. We got to remember what numbers we're dealing with here when we talk about discovery. One in one thousand uh, exploration uh, projects become uh, an operating mine. So it's extremely mm. rare to get onto something economic. But if you have some information there that points to um, they're likely uh, they're likely being an anomaly or something that needs testing, that that drilling is the only way you can basically um put a put an end to to the question you're, you you want to answer so yeah drilling is everything for uh, a company and for geologists no absolutely absolutely it's um it's worth mentioning as well that um a, a lot of junior geologists are thrown out onto drill rigs thrown out well they go onto drill rigs and yeah yeah off you go but i i as I've got older, I, I always think that the most experienced geologist should be on the drill rig and, and they should teach the young people. You shouldn't just put a young geologist out there because they might miss something that through just their inexperience, uh, they may, might miss something really key. So you should have your, your, your most suitable geologist on the drill rig at all, all the times because it, is, it, it, it defines, it can make and break a company. And that experienced geologist should then teach the younger geologists, um, you know, that they, they, they might miss some kind of alteration. They might miss D veins in, in core or something like that um, or, or whatever. So drilling is really, really important to so get your best people on the drill rig. Don't just give it to numpties and um, always have a geo on the rig. I mean, drillers can, um, you know, they can look at the, uh, the color um they they, they they can they they've got a feeling when you're in in the mineralization they they pick up on things pretty quickly so you can learn a lot from from drillers but um yeah always have a an experienced geologist on the rig at all times one thing you don't want to do as a geologist is end a hole in mineralization 
because once you move off the location that you're drilling the hole, um, it's much more expensive to come back onto that hole, run down and drill it. And if you're drilling something like uh, RC drilling, it's very hard to run down. But it can be very hard to run down those holes. Who knows what's happened to that hole since? It could have fallen in. It could be yeah. um, it could be something in the way the driller doesn't want to risk re-entering that hole because of whatever ground condition reasons. So if you if you end a hole in mineralization as a geo, it does happen. Uh, but it's it's just something you don't really want to see. If you're looking at a, <laughs> at some results and you're the geo on the rig where you've just got this like bonanza or just some grade at the end of the very last sample of the drill hole. Um, yeah, there will be questions asked. What what did you see in this? And then likely your boss will go over, look at the drill chips. If they see something that could indicate mineralization there and you've ended that <laughs> hole, you can be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But it does Absolutely. happen um, because, yeah, it, basically what happens at the end of these drill holes with um, air core drilling and RC drilling and, of course, diamond drilling, uh, you go out to the drill rig. If you're drilling air core and RC, there's always the geologist on these rigs, basically all the time. Uh, geologist is monitoring these rigs all day. It's his job to go out there for 12 hours and look after the rig and make sure no holes are ended in mineralization, basically, and make sure, you know, the drillers are doing the right thing, safety-wise, yep. um, quality of samples are good. So it's very important. So um, basically, dr the driller will come over to you at the end of the hole, dog, or uh, you'll have to go and sieve a pile of dirt, take it back to the ute or the, the truck that you're working on, have a look. If there's any indication of mineralization there, drill another rod. And you just go, you just look over the driller, bang, drill another rod, please. Um, and then just, you want to be absolutely sure that you're not ending holes in mineralization. Very important to, to note. And of course, if you see um, some results released uh, in an announcement and you see that the, the last hole's got uh, mineralization in it, yeah, there's questions that you'll need to ask there. Uh, let's, what are they going to do about, about that? How are they going to follow that up? But yeah, basically the job yeah. is to... Make sure you've, um, yeah, you've drilled through your target and you don't end a hole in mineralization. No, oh, absolutely, you're dead right. You know, if 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 I see a hole ended in mineralization, it's it's like okay, they must have run out of rods. <laughs> you know, that's it. If in doubt, go deeper. Um, like you say, you know, it's uh, it, it's not. If a company says, "Oh, it's, it ended in mineralization," blah blah, and, and it's a teaser. It's not. It's a screw up. It's or, or there's a very good reason why it, it, it stopped there. Um, it's exactly even right. now, yeah, e e even now with you know laptops and you know all, all that kind of stuff, I have a hand drawn paper section with me in the U all the time and I update it because I think, well, oh, hang on, you know, that 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 lithology shouldn't be there. So you're always referring back to you know, uh, plan your drill and drill your plan. That's you know, that's that that's the you've always got to do that you've got to change things on the fly sometimes you know you say oh that that was unexpected that bit of um uh biff or willy wally formation wasn't meant to be there it is there oh there must be a fault in there okay that changes the whole model okay let's drill deeper let's find out what's in there so always be on 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 you know on top of your game understand you know what your section is meant to look like what you are planning to uh, intersect um yeah Crayons and pieces of paper still have a place in today's uh, dr drilling in the 21st century, for sure. The funnest part of being a geologist, I reckon, is getting this picture in your head of what you're drilling, um, of what you're drilling is is doing uh, in terms of mineralization. So you basically, yeah, you just have a heavy colored pencils, you have a A3 piece of graph paper, and you're there sketching in what you're seeing with the with the rocks, your litho boundaries, your mineralization. Um, yeah, and it's. It's just a, a very still a very important uh, part of exploration, even though we've got all this technology now. I think it's you know, old pen and paper uh, geology yep. still got a still got a big place. Um, back to let's go back to air core drilling and rab drilling because that hmm. is that can really send the results from these can really send a share price to the moon if they have good hits. So basically, how it works is the air core rig is coming along testing multiple targets it's just it's just moving really fast and it's drilling holes into soft ground so it'll the the, the rig will stop drilling as soon as it hits fresh rock yeah and then let's say you do hit fresh rock the the rig will literally max out it won't be able to grind anymore and it will the driller will look over to you and say that's the end of the hole 
if you get a sample coming back that looks good, um, what you can then do is put a hammer on these aircore rigs and have it operate like an RC rig. So you can come back down the hole and just hammer away for a bit. These hammers are not super powerful, but they can they can test the rock um, for a few meters if you like. It's it's a slow method, but it's um, if you're like I said, if you're ending a hole in something that looks like mineralization in an aircore rig, you can always go back down. Uh, and put a hammer on and bash through and test what you've got. So if you do see uh, results come back at the bottom of an air core hole, so we'll have an AC abbreviation on it, um, you can actually test further into the fresh rock with an air core rig, but it is very slow. Drillers hate doing it, uh, but it's a way to to test um, if you see something that looks good there as a, as a geologist. And I've done a lot of air core drilling. It's a super effective no, way of just basically hammering a tenement and testing all these little anomalies you may have from soils or, or geophysics. Uh, super effective way, but it, yeah, it doesn't work all around the world. I, I assume it won't work in where you've got regolith and transport cover. So that's Western Australia and West Africa mainly. And obviously through, um, through some parts where you've got uranium deposits and, and soft, um, soft sediments. But yeah, it's, it's a, it, it can really add value to a stock is results from air core drilling. Have you had any experience with um, with that before, Nigel? Yeah, air, air core. Um, I've only ever done in WA, um, but I've had experience of it. Um, we we were drilling out in this well near the South Australian border, and I think it was Permian that was um, uh, glacial deposits. And we were air coring down. It was fantastic. Just a vertical hole, blah, blah, blah. And bang, hit, hit rock. Okay. Yep. Case off. Uh, change out the diamond. Um, did all that. Let it set. So we sort of came back the next day. We drilled 30 centimetres and it was a boulder. And we went through it and went back into the soft sediment again. Oh, so we was, we were stuffed. We had to, uh, uh, you know, core drill from that point forward. So, yeah, you've got you've got to just uh, yeah cho choose your, your, your drilling technique or drilling method uh to, to the ground conditions but yeah if, you, if you're drilling in old and deeply weathered terrain rather than air core really does you you, you can blitz tenements and uh, you know it's just like you know it's a geochemical sample basically you can drill hundreds and hundreds of meters a day but it's good you know it's uh, it's representative um there's not that much contamination based on the you know good driller bad driller scenario um keeping the splitter clean, uh, you, know, or, or, you know, you've just got to keep your QA, QC going. And uh, Rab and Air Core are th thoroughly decent methods to um, explore with, yeah. Yeah, besides um, auger drilling, which is another one that you just have a, on the back of a ute, goes around and it's basically like soil sampling, it just punches a little tiny hole, a metre or, or two thick um, in the ground. Not super effective. Uh, but yeah, at least with Air Core drilling, you can and punch through the regolith and the cover mm. and until you hit that fresh rock. And then if you want, you can put the hammer on and you can test a little bit of that fresh rock, which is, of course, in Western Australia where you've got your ancient rocks. Um, it's buried by yeah, a shitload of, shitload of weathering and, and cover if you're out on the fringe of the Yulgarn where I was for a mm. while. Where you've just got Sometimes you've got up to 150 metres of tertiary cover before you come into regolith and then you come into fresh rock so air core is super effective in the likes of australia and yeah a lot of these companies on the asx it'll be their their first go-to uh drilling method for for testing their their anomalies and, and their areas of interest oh, absolutely yeah you know transported cover uh if you've got you know namibian kalahari sands you know, you've got transported soil in, in wa or black cotton soil in parts of africa it's the cheapest and quickest way to get through all that into the non-transported in situ stuff underneath. And um, yeah, Rabin Air Corps is fantastic for that. Absolutely. Cool, mate. I think we've covered a lot there. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today, mate, and taking the time. It's been been really good. I think a lot of investors will get uh, some information out of this and help them understand what geologists are thinking when they, when they um, choose a, a different drilling method and, uh, yeah, and what those what those reasons are. So yeah, thanks very much, Nigel. Appreciate it. Ah, pleasure, mate. Pleasure. Anytime. Okay. Take it easy, mate.